specialist, master gardener with advanced training for our association. And today I'd like to talk to you about vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is the original earth friendly garbage disposal. So let's look into it and find out why. There are two very good types of composting, hot composting and vermicomposting, which is also a cold composting method. But why is that? These are the fastest methods to reduce solid organic waste into compost. So what is vermicomposting? It's the use of composting worms, which are also earthworms, but they're a specialized kind of earthworm to convert organic waste matter into a nutrient rich amending compost. And this nutrient rich compost is called worm poop. The original earth friendly garbage disposal, a proverbial win-win situation. It's a convenient way to dispose of organic waste. It saves space in our county landfills. Well, an itty bit. It's good for our environment. It's a wonderful homemade compost. It's ideal composting method for our home and apartment dwellers. And it gives worms a happy home with free eats. The benefits of worm composting are many. The richest natural fertilizer known to man. Why? Because of the worms. Composting worms are a natural filter for impurities and chemicals. Their intestinal tract filters all of that stuff out in their digestive processes. It's all because of that, the castings are 100% organic. They're completely safe and they smell earthly, just like regular compost when made correctly. And it's ready to use right out of the package. It's got a natural pH that runs from seven to slightly acidic, and it won't burn your plants. And it's richer in essential nutrients like N, P, and K than traditional compost. Nutrients and minerals are also in their most useful form to make, and it makes soil more absorbent, just like regular compost. Because they are in their mo more useful form, it also aids in plant nutrition absorption through the use of mycorrhizal fungi. It also promotes healthier soil and plants, increase, increasing produce yields, and it improves germination and seedling growth, which helps prevent seed rot and premature wilt. And if you look at this little picture, this is an actual picture of worm castings, worm poop. And they tend to have that grainy appearance because it's poop. <laughs> so which worms do you wanna pick for your vermicomposting bin? Let's take a look at a few. The foremost, most favored, most recommended, most preferred preferred type of composting worm is the red wiggler, also known as red worms or manure worms. Why are they called manure worms? Well, if you've ever gone out in the pasture looking for fishing worms and you've turned over a manure pile, you're gonna find these little red worms. Those are red wigglers. They live in the uppermost top six inches of organic waste material found on the surface of the soil. And that's also where they feed. They thrive in warm environments. They are heavy breeders, uh, but again, they are epigeic. That means they're shallow feeders also, also just within that six inches of organic waste. They don't burrow down into the soil. There are, they number about 800 to 1,000 per pound of worms. Now, the second one I'd like to talk about is the European night crawler. This is the one you might actually go out and buy as a fishing worm. They produce slightly, in slightly cooler temperatures, they prefer that, and they don't 
uh, reproduce as fast as a red wiggler that because they are slower but larger excuse me they are larger but slower to mature so that means they're not quite as effective in converting waste as the smaller red wiggler and they number 300 to 400 per pound another one that has also been talked about as a composting worm a night crawler lumpricus terrestris is a common earthworm species they are sold to farmers and gardeners but they are a deep burrowing worm which can burrow down to three to six feet deep and they're more commonly used for soil aeration and water penetration and they come up to the surface of the soil to deposit their castings. And they, because of this, because they're deep burrowing, they will not adapt to worm bins. They'll be crawling out all the time. And then one more I'd like to mention, an, a red worm, which is also called a drift worm and a cousin to the night crawler. Um, they are not a true compost worm, even though they've also been talked about as used in vermicomposting. Uh, they are a horizontal um, upper soil burrower, and they, they are large and lively and great as a fishing worm, uh, but they feed on organic material that's already in a high state of decomposition, which is already rotting organic waste. Um, they are not native to the United States, and, and because of the way they feed, they are considered very invasive to our native forests. So again, if you're going to pick the worms you would like to have for your vermicompost bin, you want to look at the red wiggler, which I just talked about first, and its cousin, the European nightcrawler. And you can see the difference here in size. Pretty amazing. Okay, some interesting facts about the red wiggler. It's deaf, blind, mute, breathes through its skin, ooh, and its skin cells can also taste and sense light. And they don't have any teeth. So they chew with a gizzard, just like a bird. They're also considered hermaphrodites, which means they have both male and female sex organs, but, they can't produce alone. They need a partner. They like their bedding moisture to be at 75 to 85 percent, which is the same moisture content that needs to be in regular composting. They prefer temperatures of 50 to 85 degrees, but they thrive in a smaller range of 60 to 75 degrees. They don't sleep they have a motionless period. I'm wondering if they're meditating or they're going to their safe space or something. Um, and they don't need, and they do need, uh, they do not need deep bins because again, they live in that top six inches of organic waste. They eat and live in that area. Then they're considered a tube with a gut, which means they eat up to half their weight daily in organic waste materials. Their intestinal tract contains 1,000 times more beneficial microbes than the food they consume. But their lifespan, well, it varies depending on the conditions in the bin. So here's a little look at a cross section of a red worm. And you can see um, this is their head, body parts, their, their hearts. They have five hearts. Um, here's their male reproductive organs, their female. Uh, here is their clitel. Clitel. This is where they um, eject their uh, cocoons, their eggs, and their long intestinal tract. So what happens if a worm gets cut? Do you end up with two worms? No. Barney red wiggler dies. You cannot make more worms by cutting them into pieces. So we're going to look at the uh, life cycle of a uh, 
red wiggler. And the first one to look at is that uh, the egg stage. The adult worm produces two to three cocoons per week and the cocoons contain four to six baby worms. The incubation period for the cocoons is about 23 days. The juvenile stage, which begins once that baby worm has hatched and they're about an inch long, and then they are at that time, they are heavy eaters and they're ready to vermicompost, but they're not able to produce. They do a lot of growing in that juvenile stage, growing from a half an inch long to almost two inches long before they fully mature and become adults. The maturing stage takes four to 60, 40 to 60 days to reach. And at that time, they become sexually active and are ready to produce. The difference in appearance between a juvenile and that adult is this band right here where they release their cocoons. The lifespan again, can, depending on the conditions in the bin, if everything's right, everything's happy and everything's working well, worms can live up to four to five years and sometimes even longer if everything is good. So what do you use in your worm bin? What kind of organic waste? Well, the first thing I'd like to look at are the browns. These are the same components that you put in a regular composting system. The browns, which are carbons, are considered the bedding for your vermicom vermicomposting bin. These are newspapers, aged straw, paper egg cartons, non-glossy cardboard, and you can see the list goes on and on. What you actually feed your worms when you give them food are the greens the nitrogens, the kitchen waste, the kitchen scraps, vegetable scraps, non-citrus fruits, coffee grounds, and tea bags, and some grains if they're cooked. Also, there's a bonus ingredient that you can put into your worm bins. These are eggshells. And we'll talk about that a little bit more about why they're important. Okay, so how do we get started? with vermicomposting. Well, the first thing we need to do is decide, do we have a container in mind to determine the square foot surface area of a container? You're gonna measure the width and the length and in inches and then multiply them together. Then you're gonna divide that by 144 inches. Why that? Because a square foot is 12 inches by 12 inches. And when you multiply that, you get 144. That will give you the square foot surface area at the top of your bin. Now, the reasonable worm stocking densities for a vermicomposting bin is a half a pound to one and a half pounds per square foot of surface area. The maximum is two pounds of worms per square foot of surface area. So if you had four square foot of surface area and you wanted to put one half pound <laughs> of worms per square foot, you're gonna be using two pounds of worms in your worm bin, suggested here. So how many worms do you need? Well, it's really recommended that you start slow with your vermicomposting get comfortable with it, get used to what you're doing. So start out with that half a pound per square foot of surface area of worms for your bin. Now for red wigglers, which number 1600 to 2000 per two pounds, you could even, if you order two pounds, uh, that would be enough for four square foot. European night crawlers, which again was the larger, cousin to the red wigglers. They number 600 to 800 per two, for two pounds. So you know what you're getting there in a four square foot area. Now, if you wanna kick it up 
and you're using an existing worm bin and you're confident with your setup, you can pretty much feel safe to stock one pound of worms per square foot of surface area. So again, if then if you had four square foot in your bin of surface area, you could feel confident that you could go ahead and use four pounds of worms in that bin. The advantages are that you get a higher waste processing capacity and you have the potential increase of more worm production. The worms are getting happy and they're reproducing and making lots of babies. Okay. Uh, again, if you're really, really confident and you're ready for that next level, then you can go ahead and step it up to putting two pounds of worms per square foot. But be very careful. Make sure you know what you're doing. You're very comfortable in how you're managing your vermicomposting bin before you make that decision. And one more aspect to consider, maybe, but I really prefer using the square foot method is figuring worms to organic waste ratio. Now, an average American adult creates about a pound of organic waste kitchen scraps per day. You need four times more weight in worms than you create in food waste daily. So that means a family of four, which would create four pounds of waste per day, would need 16 pounds of worms if they intended to put all that four pounds of waste in their worm bin, which is not really realistic. Okay, so you've got all that information and you feel confident and you want to do this. So what do you need to do first? You need to build that bin. So the materials you're going to need are one to two, eight to 10 gallon opaque plastic storage containers. And we're just going to give you this as an example, okay? You may want to adjust your size of your container and make it smaller, but that's up to you. You need an electric drill and a 332nd spit, and you need one to two pounds of red wiggler worms. You also want to use, it's best recommended to use newspaper that's, um, that does not have any glossy pages on it, and you want to shred that up. That's going to be your bedding material. If you want to use additional bedding, bedding material like uh, torn up cardboard or, or egg cartons or whatever, that's optional. You're going to want grit. What is grit? Well, remember I talked about earlier that worms, your composting worms do not have teeth. They have a gizzard. Well, just like birds who have gizzards, they need grit to help grind up that organic waste when it gets into the gizzard to help digest it. So the grit can be those eggshells. You can, you can uh, clean those eggshells and pulverize them and use that fine pulverized eggshell as grit. Uh, you can also use untreated garden soil, compost, vermiculite, or even sand. C please keep in mind that untreated soil, compost, and sand will add a lot of weight to your bedding that can push it down and compress it. Eggshells and vermiculite are two of the lightest grit choices you can make. Why do I stress that? Because again, it's the weight, pressing down and compacting the bedding. You do not want your grit to take up more than 5% of your bedding. Okay, so the steps to do now to build your vermicomposting bin is you're gonna drill some drain holes in the bottom and you're gonna drill several holes around the sides for ventilation. It's important, just like any composting situation that you have plenty of airflow, plenty of air and drainage in your process. Once you have all those holes put into your bin, then you wanna prepare the bedding shred the newspaper up and you can hand tear it. It's pretty easy to do. And then you're gonna moisten your bedding. You can put it in a bucket of water, wring it out. And again, wring it out to that consistency, just as if you grabbed a handful of compost, composting organic waste out of your composter bin. When you squeeze it, 
you don't have any moisture running down your arm. This is the, the moisture content you want in that bedding material. If you just squeeze out the water, shake it all out loose and layer it into your bin. Then add some grit, one to two cups of grit over each layer of bedding material you add to your bin. Then you're ready for your worms. So it's advisable that you make your bin, get it all set up so it can set two or three days to kind of settle in and then order your worms. Because you want to have the bin all ready to go to receive your worms when you get them. And they're going to come pretty fast. And this That was what a pound of worms looked like. Um, one more thing. When you're making those holes in your bin, do not make them this size. These are open invitations for worms to go on a crawl about outside your bin. So keep the holes small, but also check them to make sure they don't get clogged up. Okay, here's a picture. Um, this is from when I had a, from a composting bin. And you can see where I have scattered uh, crushed um, eggshells over the top to add that grit source to my bedding. Also, when I fed uh, organic waste to my worms, I also added a little bit of grit, those, again, those crushed eggshells to the top of the food. That puts it right there, makes it very convenient for the worms and it makes the processing of the, the waste a lot faster. Okay, when do you know, or where should you um, keep your uh, worms? Okay, this review just a little bit. Tolerate, they tolerate um, well temperatures of 50 to 85 degrees. They thrive in temperatures of 65 to 75 degrees, and, but they still need that moisture content of 75 to 85% in their bedding. So where do you keep your bin? Well, you can keep it indoors, under a sink, in the kitchen, in a pantry, a utility room or closet, a family room, a garage, a carport, or even a basement. Outdoors, you need to give it a little bit more consideration and care about where you place it because you want to protect it from extreme temperatures. You want to put it on the north side of a structure to protect it from wind and rain and secure the lid from rodents or any other critters that might want to get into your container and eat your worms. And of course, you're always going to want to monitor the moisture daily because outside that moisture is going to dry out quicker. So you want to make sure that you keep everything just right for your worms. Okay, so feeding your worms. You want to feed them slowly at first and increase your food portion as the population grows. You want to feed one to two times a week limit the distribution and make sure that you grind or chop up the food scraps if you can, like in a blender or processor. This allows the worms to process and eat that food quicker and speeds up composting. And it also reduces the smells in your bin. You wanna make sure that you cover your feeding every time to help prevent fruit flies from finding the food. So like I said previously, I pull the bedding back in a corner, put my food in, add my grit, and then I cover that feeding back over with the bedding. And also remember too, browns are important in composting, but they're also considered a food source for your worms. So if they eat up all the food that you're giving them from the kitchen waste, they can still snack and graze on the bedding that they're crawling around in. So to review again, what you can give them, yes, you can give them vegetable peelings, non-citrus fruits, melons, they love cantaloupe. You can give them coffee grounds and filters, some in small amounts, tea bags, some grains and cereals, and of course, the crushed eggshells. 
you're going to want to stay away from, just like you would in regular composting, dairy products, fats, oils and oily foods, meat, poultry, fish, and highly acidic and spicy things that might give your worms a tummy ache. And of course, no pet fecus in your bin because of pathogens it might bring to your uh, environment there. The troubleshooting, you're going to have some issues occasionally. So it's best if you know in advance what to do and how to prevent it. If your worms are dying or trying to escape, and that can happen sometimes, if you have too much food, you want to reduce your feeding amount. If it's too wet, if the bedding's too wet, add more dry bedding. If it's too dry, add some moistened bedding or just moisten the bedding. That's good to have that spray bottle. You can uh, mist your uh, bedding and help maintain that moisture. If it's too hot or too cold, move the bin to a better environment. And if the bedding is used up, you either add more bedding to the bin or you harvest the, the castings out of it and start again. Now, if your bed stinks, there's some other issues there. It's either not getting enough air, which means you need to either drill some more ventilation holes or even check the ones you have to make sure they're not clogged up. Too much food, you wanna reduce, again, the feeding amounts. If it's too wet, add more bedding. And sometimes you may have a massive, a massive worm death, which in such cases, the solution is just to start over, start again. And then also there's a flu, a fruit fly issue, it, if you should happen to have those, and that's what this looks like. This is a fruit fly, and they, they look a little different. There's more than one kind. Uh, it's because you've got exposed food in your bed. You want to make sure that you always bury or remove food in the bedding if they're not eating it up quickly. But you can also try setting up a, a fruit fly trap. You can buy commercially made ones, or you can make one yourself by putting some uh, apple cider vinegar in a bowl and setting it there close by, and that will attract the fruit fries. Fruit, fruit flies. You can also add orange peel to the surface of your bedding, and this attracts mites, and it helps you monitor the mite issue that could occur in your bin. Okay, uh, you get all kinds of critters that come to the bin. It's not a segregated world, but you're gonna have good bugs and bad bugs sometimes in your bin. So let's take a look at a few of those. The good bugs are like roly polies. They're a crustacean, a vegetarian. They will help eat some of that scraps you're putting in there to feed your worms. You may also see earwigs. These are little de decomposers that can pinch if they get provoked. You're gonna see on the end of the um, earwig that little pincher right there. You can also find springtails sometimes. These are again, teeny weeny de decomposers and uh, they can jump too if they get threatened. Another one you might find in your bin is millipedes. These, this is another vegetarian decomposer. Also potworms, these are sometimes confused with baby red wigglers, but they are white. Um, so keep an eye out for them maybe. And then there's white and brown mites and they will compete with worms for food and may show up if it's too wet in your bin. And then lastly, um, you may also encounter black soldier fly larva. Um, that, their larva looks kind of like a maggot and they eat food scraps also. Uh, some people will just use black soldier fly larva in their uh, bin instead of worms. They actually do process food scraps faster than a red wiggler. And then we need to look at the bad bugs because sometimes they can get in there. And the first one is a centipede. They're rare in worm bins, but if you find them in there, they are dangerous to your worms. They will kill them. Uh, you might also find, again, like we talked about, the fruit or black soldier flies. You wanna make sure that you always cover your feedings to prevent 
the food from attracting either one of these. And then there's red mites. Red mites are parasitic. They can get on the worms and suck all the worm juices, killing the worm. Another one to look at and watch for are ants. If your bin is too dry, this will attract ants. So you wanna adjust the moisture level in your bin. And of course, if the bin is too dry, it can also attract roaches. So make sure that the lid on your bin fits securely so that critters like roaches can't get underneath the lid. And also make sure that you bury your feedings again because that fresh food, those kitchen scraps, that's an invitation to all kinds of other insects and critters. And you may also see spiders occasionally in your bin. They're not a, th a threat to your worms. Just watch out for yourself if you should encounter a spider and know what kind it is. And one more thing, and I talked about this before, about your um, the bedding being compressed by too heavy a grit or you're getting too much moisture in the bin. This can push all the air out of your uh, bedding and it can create an anaerobic situation. When the, when the bedding gets really wet, there's no oxygen, rot is starting, it attracts anaerobic bacteria. And this is, this is unhealthy for your worms and it gets smelly and it creates a real mess. And above all, most importantly though, do not use any poisons in your worm bin because you can also kill off your worms. I wanted you to see this because this is what it looks like when you get too much water in your worm bin, too much heavy a grit, it just creates this big congealed mass of sludge. And we encountered that several years ago um, when we had our worm bins and our worm mamas. Uh, this was our first experience with vermicomposting and we were learning and sometimes we'd end up with a situ situation like this where we had this big heavy mass of just sludge. Okay, so how do you know when your bin is ready to harvest the castings off of it? So when is it time to harvest? Well, if you look inside your bin and almost all of the bedding is consumed or your bin is full of castings, it's pretty much gonna tell you it's ready to harvest them off. So you wanna stop feeding for one to two weeks prior to harvesting if you're gonna harvest that whole bin to make sure that the worms finish eating off any bedding or anything like that that's still in the bin. There's several different harvesting methods that you can try. And we'll talk about a few of those right now. The first one is a migration method where worms will follow food scraps from one side of the bin to the other. You can add some bedding, fresh new bedding to one end and along with a feeding and that will pull the worms from one side of the bin where all the, comp the, the castings are to that fresh bed bedding and feeding. And then you can remove those castings uh, after the worms are left. There's still gonna be a few worms in those castings, but you can take them out and add them back to your bin. Another one is to set it up where there's a filter between um, areas in your bin where one side has got that new uh, bedding and the other side is just castings and, and the worms will migrate through that filter to get to the other side. And then there's also the photosensitivity method where you open your bin, you shine a light on it and this pushes all the worms down and then you remove castings from the surface. And the same method is also used in what's called the volcano or cone method where you make little piles like you see in this picture down below and you shine a light on it and this pushes the worms to the bottom of that cone or pile and then you gently remove castings from the top until you've gotten all the castings away from the worms. And then the, the method that we used to employ all the time was just the free for all method where you just dump it all out onto a table or a tarp 
and you just go through there and separate the worms from the castings. We used to do that many times with the worm bins we had years ago. And probably maybe the best way, especially if you're just gonna use small amounts, is continuous harvest. That means when you see that you've got one to two inches of castings in the bottom of the, of the bin, below the bedding, then you just pull some of the bedding out of the way and you pull out one to two cups of worm castings and then replace that area, fill that area back up with new bedding. And this works pretty good. I've done this a lot with a smaller worm bin that I used to have as a demonstration bin. Um, and it, it worked very easy. And I was always, it seems like every time I turn around, taking some of those castings out of there. Okay, so you've got all this vermicompost. What do you do with it? Well, there's different things. There's lots of different things you can use it on. Uh, on indoor house plants, you can add it to the potting soil. You can mix, have the mix contain 25 to 40% of castings versus the potting soil. You can top dress uh, around your plants every two to three months with castings. And you can also use it as part of a seed starting mix using one third uh, castings to three parts, one part castings to three parts of seed mix or compost or what have you like that. In the garden, you can incorporate castings into the surface soil. You can add castings to the holes for seeds or transplants when you're planting. And you can also side dress during the growing season side dress or top dress during the growing season around your plants. You can also use it around established roses as a top dressing, around perennials, and also around uh, new and established lawns and trees, shrubs, and berries. But probably one of the most favorable uses for castings, vermicompost, is to make worm casting tea. To do that, We'll talk about that in a minute. You can also use lechate, which is the drainage off of the bin. And some commercially made bins are set up so that they it, there's a catcher underneath the catches that excess moisture that drains off. You can use it also as a fertilizer. It's not necessarily as strong or contains as much nutrients, but it is still very usable. Um, so you can collect the lechate drainage and reapply it to the worm bedding for moisture, or you can use it around plants. Or again, like uh, I said, we can, you can also make worm casting tea. And you can mix that with water for an excellent super uh, fertilizer by using one cup of worm castings in one gallon of water. You can steep it for 24 hours. Um, and then use it immediately. But when you do that, you can put it in a sock, tie it up, put it in the water, and, it, and water doesn't have to be hot, just cold is fine, but let it steep for 24 hours to make that tea, and then it's ready to use. And reason why you need to use it um, immediately is because all the good microbes in that tea will only live for about 24 hours until all the oxygen is used up in that solution. So make it, use it, and, and realize the benefits from it. Okay, something I'd like to show you here real quick uh, is a, a worm bin that's been layered with um, soil and sawdust. And I want you to see how quickly worms will eat that and turn it into compost. You can see them moving around through the sawdust and the soil as they eat, consume, digest, and excrete uh, their waste. You can see the color changing in the sawdust areas from the sawdust to their castings, replacing the sawdust. This is over a period of, I think, about 28 days. Um, moisture is added to the bin along to maintain that uh, 
adequate moisture level, but you can, it's really fascinating to see all these worms moving around in the bin, um, doing what they're doing, uh, consuming the sawdust and turning it into compost. You can also see too how as this process continues and they're consuming all the sawdust, how it tends to, the air is being removed, it's compressing. Just like in a normal composting situation where you start out with a full bend of organic waste materials. And over time, as that process of decomposition takes place, all that organic waste is broken down into smaller parts and changed, but it's also because it's in smaller parts, it's removing all the air pockets and becoming a smaller mass. Okay, one of the best things I can recommend if you do set up a vermicomposting bin is to keep a journal, take notes, log off from observations on moisture, temperatures, your feedings, reproduction, activity level, et cetera, and how much you're getting in, in uh, castings off your bin. This will help you monitor the health and how you need to change things to keep your bin happy and healthy. Okay, any questions? If you have questions, please um, contact our help desk um, and, and they'll get in touch with me and I'll try to do my best to answer your questions. Otherwise, please use these links below uh, for any extra information you need. And I have a question. Okay. This is Art. Uh, I've got a bag of uh, worm uh, castings uh, that they gave me at that uh, workshop in Houston. Uh, is there a shelf life limit to how soon should I use that? And if I was to do my own vermicast uh, or uh, composting, when I collect the, the, the castings, uh, if I don't need them right away, what's the best way to store them? And is there a limited time that I have before I have to use them? To realize the full potential on your castings, you want to use them right away. Because just like I talked about with the worm tea, all the goodness, all those microbes in that worm tea are only going to survive for so long because of lack of oxygen over time. So in the worm castings, those beneficial microbes that are in those castings are not gonna last forever. So you can't have castings and have them on the shelf for two or three years and expect them to have the same nutritional value or, or microbial benefits as you would fresh castings that you recently got in hand. As far as storing them, I don't, know that there is a good way to store worm castings that will maintain all those microbes. I think really because this is something, you know, fresh, to get all that microbial benefit, you need to use those castings right away. Otherwise, they're still compost. Everything's been broken down, all the organic waste that they consume, it's all been broken down just like in decomposition of compost. You can still use it as compost, even though it's two or three, four years old or longer, but you're not gonna gain the same benefits that it would have provided if you'd have used it when it was fresh. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any more questions?
Well, I want to thank you again so much for attending um, today's presentation, CEU presentation. I hope I've inspired you and, and gave, given you a little challenge to start your own worm bin and see how it works for you. Um, so again, if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to contact me um, directly or, um, or go through our help desk to get in touch with me. Um, so thank you again. This has been a Worm in the Bin production. Alrighty.